forth. I live in Clarkston. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, quite a ways north. <laughs> Just a hop, skip, and a jump, right? Unless yeah. there's construction yeah. and everything's torn apart. How about you, Mark? Uh, I'm actually in London, England. So no we had, uh, the birth of our first granddaughter, her first grandbaby. Oh, awesome, man. Yeah, very excited. I I've got two granddaughters, and they're the oh. best. Oh. Yeah, it's been amazing. So it's only been a couple of weeks, but it's, yeah, it's been amazing. Hmm. So what part of London are you in? North London. I don't know how well you know uh, my daughter is a huge Arsenal football fan, <laughs> and she, she lives within listening Great. distance of any game that's going on in the stadium. Perfect. So, yeah, she's she's a crazy for football over here. Was that like a chicken and the egg? Did that happen before or after or what? Uh, yeah, she, she, grew, she was a, a phenomenal soccer player growing up, and then um, she did a couple of couple of study abroad events, uh, one to England, and then just started following a couple of their superstars, and then that was it. So we pretty much lost her to England. Once she met her husband, who's from Cambridge, like 30 generations of Cambridge uh, lineage <laughs> there, we uh, we knew it was going to be a lot of travel for us in the future, and it, and it has been. So it's good. <laughs> yeah, but Mark, what's the deal with England in the World Cup? Jeez, those <laughs> no. guys can't do any. They're they're uh, brilliant. You can't Except bring that up around up. here. You you yeah. can't say anything about that around <laughs> yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, it's uh it's it's amazing. Everybody has a passionate opinion about everything here. But yeah, the Uber drivers, the taxi drivers, anybody on the street, whether it's football or Trump. Yeah, it's, you, those are the off <laughs> subjects. You can't talk about any of that. Yeah. Or Brexit, I'm sure. Or too. Brexit, yeah. Oh gosh, that's that's a whole other thing too. Yeah. Ugh. Pause, pause, pause. This is Autoline After Hours with John McElroy and Gary Vasilash, episode five hundred and twenty-two for August twentieth of twenty twenty. TRX, the Tyrannosaurus Rex from Ram. Watch Autoline After Hours live at Autoline.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for Autoline in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. Hey, everybody, thanks for joining us on Auto Line After Hours. Where, where's Gary? Yeah. Oh, there you are. All right. How are you doing, John? I'm doing pretty good. Yeah. So, so last week we actually saw one another in person when we had the opportunity to go drive the Polestar 2. Maybe we'll talk about that a little later. But uh, yeah, we should, right? And I even recognized you behind your mask. That's right. Yeah, and it's it's been it's been months since uh, we've been doing this and uh, in, under these conditions. Very yeah. different world. Very different world. That's so, right. you know, as, as you know, over the past several weeks. Um, Dr. Data has been on a hiatus and we've been doing what's been going on in this day in history. But I just want to bring back Dr. Data a little bit here at the top of the show. And I'm going to give you a number uh -oh. and, and, and see if you can tell what this number is. It is 2,481,330. So basically 2.5 million. 2.5 million. That's how much sales in the U.S. market will be down this year. That's it's a good guess, but it's probably too low. Actually, it is the number of light duty pickup trucks that were sold last year. So why wow. did I pick that number? Why do you suppose we have that number for this show? Oh, hmm. this show, because we're going to be talking about the Ram TRX. You know it. So let's let's bring in Mark Williams. There he is. Hey Mark. Hey guys, how are you doing? This is a very exciting time. It, it is, it is. And it's exciting for us to have you on the show for the first time too. 
Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I've been a big fan of yours for a long time, and Gary and I have crossed paths over the years, uh, both in the United States and I think abroad as well, too. We've been on a couple of yeah. overseas trips together. And, and and you're the guy that, it, journalist that I know that knows more about light duty pickup trucks than anyone. So we're yeah. very glad we got you. I, I'm an unabashed pickup truck fan. So I, I am an enthusiast. I love them. I think they do uh, amazing things for the economy and amazing things for the people who buy them as well. So yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. That's great. Well, then with that, we should bring in our special guest for today. We've got Jeff Roselli, who is model responsible for the TRX. First off, I'm going to say hello, Jeff. How, uh, how are you out there? Doing well, thank you. Okay, now you have to explain what the hell does model responsible mean? Ah. Uh. Uh, so we have sort of two roles. There's model responsible and chief engineer um, as far as managing programs within uh, FCA. And I am, I'm actually both roles for the TRX. So I have uh, the cost, the timing, uh, and also the technical responsibility. So I have complete program responsibility uh, for the TRX. Gotcha. But I, I only ask that because I've never heard of that title before in the industry, in the history of the industry. It's got to be an FCA specific kind of title designation. For sure. For sure. And usually when folks outside ask me, I say, you know, I'm, I'm the chief engineer. And they typically, they <laughs> dial right into that. It sort of works, right? Yeah, we all understand right. that. <laughs> all right. So, Jeff, so for people who have been living in a cave, ha, 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 what is the TRX? Uh, basically, the, the TRX is the biggest, baddest, quickest, fastest uh, pickup truck on the market. Um, it is basically the, the culmination of everything we know so far, is making off-road vehicles, making high-performance vehicles. Uh, it's a 702-horsepower fire-breathing monster that can uh, rip across the desert at you know, 100 miles an hour, equally as comfortable as it can drive through a snowstorm and you know, pick up a gallon of milk. And so, look pretty tough doing it all the while. So, Jeff, I got to believe this whole project started when somebody was talking about the Ford Raptor and you went, wait a minute, we can do that and maybe even make it faster. Uh, you know, we, we really always enjoy a challenge. Um, there's, I, I'll, I'll let the, the brand folks talk about, you know, market opportunities and things like that, but from a bunch of performance guys, you know, this was something that we we really wanted to do, and when the opportunity presented itself, we definitely you know threw ourselves in all, all the way, it's, and it's been a it's been a really really great project. So, you've got the six point two supercharged Hemi in this. Yes. So, what did you do to it to get seven hundred and two horsepower out of it, and why seven hundred and two? So so. Uh, you know, this is a, a different application of the engine from the others. Uh, in the case of the truck, we had some very specific objectives we wanted to tackle. And, uh, you know, the, we're seeing on the screen right now the air box for the truck. Uh, this thing really had high goals of, of both uh, water fording, you know, how deep of water can the truck drive through uh, without ingesting any water. And also, we, we knew the, the ultimate environment for this truck would be, you know, high-speed desert running which is a really you know, filthy, dusty environment. So going into this, we knew we had to get the airbox high and we had to put a, a massive amount of air filtration in it. Um, you know, this, this box has the ability to capture five times um, the debris of, of our, our primary competitors uh, and, and really anything else we have within the, the corporation. Uh, it breathes both you know, above the radiator and also through that dedicated hood scoop that you see. And it's it's a it's a great filtration. It's a great separator, right? We've got um, some vortex generators in there that actually you know spin cycle the the sand and debris out. Um, but with that, you know, there's a little bit of uh, induction loss through that. And again, given the unique application of this truck, we really thought that was important. Um, at the rear of the car, right, the exhaust. We've made it as high a flow as we possibly can. I mean, it's got a it's got an awesome sound. I mean, when you hear this thing, when you hit the go pedal, we're, we're not really holding anything back there. 
Uh, but it is an extra, you know, four or five feet of exhaust just because this is the biggest thing we've ever put this engine in. So again, there's just there's just some losses through the system. Okay, hey Jeff, can I ask a question? So 2009 is when we first saw the Raptor. This seems like a long wait for an amazing product. Uh, wh why did it take so long? Where were you 10 years ago? <laughs> 10 years ago, uh, I, it was probably shortly before I ever met you for the first time. Uh, and I, and I, you know, I was working on this this little engine called the 6.4 uh, and putting that in Grand Cherokees, right? We, uh, yeah. we uh, had started with the, the 6.1 liter V8 and in in what I'll call the Gen 1 WK Grand Cherokee. And, and at that point, I was transitioning to the, the new Grand Cherokee, really trying to defy the laws of physics with that. and um, you know, as, as things kind of evolved, uh, here we are, right? We've got this monster powertrain and, and really an opportunity with a solid platform like the, the Ram 1500 to kind of put it all together and, and, and go to that next level, right? So, Jeff, tell us a little bit about the suspension because that's so key to any kind of off-road truck. I, I'm pleased to hear you say that, you know, high-speed desert running, that's been one of the claims that Ford's made about the Raptor and the like, but... Give us some some real hardcore details here. Front and rear suspension. What'd you change on this truck? So you know we changed everything. Uh, the the we went to customers and we looked at the usages of these off road trucks and it's it's all about travel, right? Travel is king. Uh, this truck was packaged around a thirteen inch front and a fourteen inch rear travel, and, and and it's not a rebound situation. It is all the way through the travel. Just a massive amount of both jounce and rebound travel. Uh, so what does that drive? You know, that drives longer control arms, uh, strong control arms, both, you know, the, the fronts are obviously significantly wider. Our, our track is up six inches. Uh, in the rear, we've got much longer arms out of, uh, you know, stamped steel. It retains the Ram 1500's five-link suspension setup, but all of the dimensions are longer. Everything is stronger. And, um, uh, uh, Starting from it was all about packaging. I, I like to tell the story about the rear of the truck, right? We had this, you know, it's a pickup truck. It's its job is to be able to haul cargo. So that box could not be sacrificed. Um, and we had this big 35 inch tire out at the other end that we were trying to package all the suspension and all the spring between. And we spent a long time just on that spring. It's a 23.6 inch free length spring. There is nothing larger in the production vehicle industry. Uh, and, and it took us, you know, we scoured the world. We found two places that could make it. And uh, we worked really hard with the, with, with the supplier to come up with this package. And, uh, you know, that, that's just kind of one story about, about the, the obstacles you come up against. So, right, big architecture changes. But really where, where it all comes together is our, our, our Bilstein uh, Blackhawk E-squared dampers. So, these are capable of you know, 22 pounds all the way up to one ton is the kind of damping forces they can achieve. And, and that, that is really the, the super special sauce that allow the adaptability of the truck and really to control that huge range of motion. Um, we've got uh, actuation both on the rebound and the compression side. So we can tackle the truck, you know, whether one corner is doing one thing, the other is doing the other. We use uh, you know, a host of, there's four wheel position sensors, three accelerometers. We monitor both where the platform is and where the wheel end is. And, uh, you know, we, in the case of when, you were, when you're in Baja mode running across the desert, you're trying to keep that platform stable. Uh, we allow you know, some really neat things like a lot of recline to the vehicle so you can sort of, we say, pre-stage it for a jump or, or an obstacle. But also, you know, if you put it in sport mode on the street, right? We, we get really firm with the dampers and try and make that truck follow the road nice and tight. It's, it's just the, you know, I've, I've, we've had this ad adaptive suspension on SRTs since 2012. And uh, this is really kind of the next level thing where we are using it not only to control that tight over the road range, but also when, when you get off road and you're, you know, jumping the truck or crossing traverses. I mean, there's some, there's some footage of the truck. And it, it it's gliding over things. There's no impacts. It's it's really just absorbing and absorbing and absorbing more. And there's nothing crazier than the first time you drive one. You know, my my development guy is is absolutely awesome, and he's riding shotgun, yelling, 
why are you slowing down? Like, you know, you accelerate over that. And this is something your mother told you, you know, whatever you do, don't do that kind of stuff. And uh, here you are doing it and the, the truck is, is getting better and better the, the faster you go. Jeff, I, I, you know, you're mentioning the travel. So it's a 40% increase compared to a normal 1500. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's, there's dimensional change there. And then the vehicle is eight inches wider than a 1500 Rebel. How did you do that? Well, <laughs> when, you, when you package all this fancy, uh, this fancy gear, uh, at the end of the day, you also need to get some coverage, right? We want to protect stones from, from flying up where they're not supposed to. Uh, so we really, you know, we put a shrink wrap body over it. Things like the, the cab section, the doors, the greenhouse, those are all carryover. But on the TRX specifically, you'll see, you know, a, a wide and broader fenders in the front and the, and the box sides in the rear. We kind of carried over the box inner section, but it really we adapted from that, that uh, I'll call it the, the catwalk at the top all the way out to the edges, really to, to wrap all that running gear and, and really no one uses the word voluptuous. So we'll say like butch, <laughs> tough, broad stance. Uh, stance. In the front, there's um, it's an SMC uh, material. In the back, it's it's good old steel. Wow. Hey, and, Jeff, specifically, um, you mentioned before that, that this vehicle is obviously making a, a promise and a commitment to anybody who's interested in buying it. Um, and but it is a pickup truck, but it's obviously a performance truck as well, too. So there must have been some serious accommodations you made to the frame itself. Can you talk about some of those changes or is it a completely new frame or is it just a modified existing frame? So 74% of the frame is new. Uh, we carried over uh, the rails and the cross members. Uh, you know, there's some additional, some pretty good uh, visual of that. There's some bracing and some things added to some carryover bits, but in reality, we we upgaged, uh, we upyielded by going to to the the highest tensile steels we could find. A lot of reinforcements. You know, some folks say, well, why not just use a heavy duty frame? Um, Heavy duty frame absolutely has its place. Uh, this this frame was tailored not only to our unique suspension pickup points, but also for the the landing loads. Um, what you would see traversing some of this crazy terrain we run this truck over. You know, we do a lot of upfront data acquisition, right? Understanding again, we went back to where do those customers run their trucks? How do they run their trucks? And you know, we we put a thousand pounds of instrumentation on a truck and we ran out and we looked at every single one of those loads and, and really what was the most efficient way uh, and again around our packaging what was the, the best method to address not only loads but function uh, you, that's kind of kind of what, what you see there it's it is a new and unique species um, and, and it's really the, the backbone for for this tough truck and towing capacity and payload capacity are pretty similar to other half ton pickup trucks is the gvw the same is that changed so so we have a unique gvw just uh based on the overall weight of the truck uh, but yes from a payload standpoint we're we're 1310 pounds from the towing capacity we're 8100 pounds that falls it within the ram 1500 lineup uh, certainly this truck has a, a unique long travel suspension with a, a spring that's tailored to that specifically so obviously it's it's not a max tow truck, but you know, between the engine and even those adaptive dampers, right? We've got a tow mode in the truck. It is it is very capable uh, of that weight that we have, we've published. So I mean, it's 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 a strong half ton pickup truck for sure. Boy, I love the picture that we're looking at right now. It shows just how much that uh, the rear suspension, particularly, can twist and turn and accommodate uh, what's going on there. But we've got a question here from our viewer, Kit Gerhardt, who wants to know, are you going to make money on this TRX or is this just a Halo product? <laughs> I will defer to Mr. Koval uh, re regarding any of any of those things. Uh, I'll tell you that th they don't really get approved unless they are a profitable operation. Uh, and certainly as in my role, I was responsible for being my financial targets. It's 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 obviously we do these things to make money, but at the same time, the buzz that this truck generates is also pretty electric, and um, 
it's 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 just an awesome product. I would also add to that that uh, I mean you've got a lot of learning with the Raptor behind you. They make plenty of money selling those Raptors in the U.S. and overseas, where they are sometimes paying double the price. So uh, so it definitely is in their best interest to do that. And if you're running a plant that's making 200, 300, or 400,000 light duty pickup trucks, you can squeeze out maybe 25,000 to make a halo truck that'll make you a lot of money. So yeah, it, it, it makes a lot of people a lot of money. <laughs> you know, not to completely turn the tables on you, Mark, but have you ever seen something this big running around the streets of London? <laughs> no, half ton pickup trucks, not in London at all, right? Just now. double decker buses. Yes, a lot of double decker. A lot of very cool vehicles and some very cool pickup <laughs> trucks, but not big half ton pickup trucks. Okay, Jeff. So you so you're talking about the things that this thing can go over. And and now maybe this is very common to you and Mark, but to me, I thought this was quite surprising. You have a jump detection system on this thing. Yeah. Uh yeah, again, the, the goal of this truck was to, to be able to do it all. And uh, you know, when you're moving at speed across undulating terrain, you, you can pick up all four tires. Uh, the jump detection is primarily there to, to I'll say, smooth the landing uh, from a driveline standpoint. Imagine it at high speeds and probably high uh, throttle pedal. Um, what we wanted is to make sure that as the front axle hit, it didn't do anything to the rest of the driveline in the rear. We really wanted that truck to land you know, pillow smooth and, and strong and aggressively and really uh, let the driver focus on what they want to do instead of worrying about any kind of shock waves through the experience. So it adjusts the suspension or it adjusts the driveline? So actually both. Uh, the suspension, again, it's got the accelerometers and the wheel position sensors. So it, it knows where it is, where it's at in travel. So when it hits full rebound, it says, hey, you know, firm up the shocks, get ready for the landing. And the same thing on the driveline side, we communicate that over the vehicle uh, communication bus. And the driveline controller knows, hey, you know, you're going to want to relax that clutch in the key case. Uh, the engine, right, will will prevent unwanted upshifts and will hold that engine right at redline again, because we know the wheels are in the air and you, you don't have any resistance from the ground. So. We want that truck to, to be, like I said, fully and ready to, to hit the ground running when it comes back down to, to terra firma. Hmm. Hey, we've got another question here from John Warniak, as a matter of fact, who was just on the show recently. And he wants to know, is there a fundamental connection between off-road racing technologies and authentic performance trucks like the TRX? And he goes on to ask, what have you learned from your TRX racing partners Ricky and Luke Johnson of Johnson Off-Road in San Diego. So you'll forgive me. I'm not real sure uh, about Ricky and Luke. Uh, I think they're more maybe on the motorsport side. Um, this one was more of an engineering exercise. I know we have definitely talked to shops like that. And in fact, our, our early feedback was from a lot of the trophy truck guys to try again to understand you know, what are customers doing and where is the limit of where do we transition from a production vehicle to really a, a trophy truck, which really throws a lot of the rules and uh, the, the street ability uh, requirements kind of kind of out the window? You mentioned two two of the modes. You mentioned auto and um, the Baja mode. So you also have sport tow, um, mud, sand, rock. So is, is this a dial that someone turns and, and what happens when, when you select a mode? So we have two methods of selecting the modes. Uh, I guess I'll start with the modes. We have what we call sort of the, the dynamic street and the dynamic offer. So street is, is the, the auto, the sport, the snow, the tow. Um, and then we have the, the, the dedicated you know, rock and Baja and the, the mud sand. Uh, in the, in the, Auto mode, we, we deliver the truck in what we believe to be kind of the, the all-around best best configuration. Uh, you'll find there that the shocks have, you know, a uh, uh, medium-high level of, of damping. The steering is is, a, is a, an everyday setting. Uh, and the driveline, we, we run with a, roughly a 40-60 torque split. Um, as you change to sport, uh, we dial the more torque to the rear to, to give more of a rear drive feel. Uh, you can also firm up the steering. 
and uh, the stability control will change its level of intervention as well to kind of let you have a little more fun. Case of snow mode, you know, we really lock down. We put 50-50 torque split. Traction control, you know, is that is that high alert? And it's it's really kind of uh, trying to put the vehicle. If, if the customer feels they're in a condition where they, they need a little extra help one way or want to have a little more fun the other way, we sort of pre-configure those. And then we also offer a custom mode. And in custom mode, really, it's all on the owner to set it up. They can choose the lightest or the firmest steering, the lightest or the firmest damping. And, uh, and also, you know, they can turn paddle shifters on and off. The transmission also, right, based on mode, it has different methods of how it, uh, not only it's sort of the shift feel, the, the feedback the customer gets, but also you know, how long does it hold gear, how aggressively does it hold gear. When we go to the off-road modes and, and See, I could probably talk about this forever, but we go to the off-road modes. Uh, Baja really frees up the suspension again, kind of allows it to get all that travel and try and keep the tire uh, in contact to get the traction. Uh, we really put a lot of torque to the rear in Baja mode. We call it a roughly a 2080 split again to kind of give the driver the ability to point the car on throttle. And again, that's a mode where stability control is really backed off because we assume there's going to be wheels spinning and. Uh, one of the coolest features there as well as in Baja mode is the transmission really shifts aggressively to keep that, that engine at, at the peak of its pretty monstrous power band as it is. Uh, and you'll find, you know, as soon as you slow down, it'll bang down shifts to really, again, keep you in that, in that really heart of the beast. So when's it going to be coming out? October 12th is our job one date. And uh, obviously uh, we're open for orders now. So you guys sold out your first 702 within three hours and get you were pretty happy about that. That's pretty good feedback. Uh, you know, I, I may be just a lowly engineer, but it, it's nice to know you're loved. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so tell me about this. So apparently you guys built a new high speed desert durability track where did you build this out in, out in arizona somewhere or yep yep our uh, our proving grounds in arizona is, is on a very very as you can expect the security these days a very large piece of land and uh this track uses pretty much the outermost perimeter of that uh, we again when we were talking to customers and looking at usages of trucks like this uh we really we um we identified kind of events that we needed to make sure we, we, we aced. And, and also it kind of doubles as a, it's our durability course as well, right? So, so we know as this truck, how it runs, um, sort of what, what uh, the customer expects, uh, and then really over the life of those routes. Um, uh, boy. As people are running those routes, right? We want to be able to show we can run that day in, day out, without running afoul of the public, um, and also really having control of those surfaces. I mean, this truck is so powerful; we do prep on that surface every other day because yeah. it can absolutely obliterate any man-made obstacle that we put out there. Right? I mean, that's we have a we basically are doing durability on our own durability course, right? It's wow. it's kind of something. <laughs> like so again. We, we developed that based on customers and, and we knew people were running. Uh, it's, it's really been quite a, quite a course, quite a, not, not only just an engineering tool, but even a driver development tool. It's, it's, it's pretty neat. Jeff, the first time that we heard about this, excuse me, <clears throat> this project was, I think back in, was it 2016 at the State Fair of Texas? Is that when we saw, saw the first concept? That's correct. That, that, that's that's obviously a long time ago, but but did the Gladiator, which I think also did a lot of durability testing at that same proving ground, did the Gladiator need to come out before the TRX, or are they two completely independent projects that work inside FCA? They are uh, independent projects from a from a leadership standpoint and uh, from a timing and a cost standpoint, but. You know, we're engineers. Everybody talks around the water cooler, and and you know, 
one of the key figures in in our durability setup in our course. He, he's a gladiator guy. And one of the, our, our go-to, you know, I, I talked about the Baja mode. We've obviously got a rock mode where this truck will, I, I like to say, billy goat up and over, you know, obstacles. My guy for all that low speed stuff, he worked for me when I was working on Wrangler, right? I mean, mm-hmm. we, we leverage the whole organization because there really are, there are experts um, in, in very specific fields and, and we'd be foolish to, to not go to those guys. Well, so what, very so interesting. Pro- oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, so what's more capable in terms of the off-road stuff, the Gladiator or your truck? <laughs> um, you know, it, it's amazing. So I, not to like, wax poetic about my own history, but I went from, <laughs> from making SRTs to, to working on Wranglers, right? I tell people I went from trying to go as fast as possible to going as slow as possible. <laughs> Certainly every vehicle uh, has, has its forte, um, but the Wrangler is, is really unbeatable in the tight stuff, right? This truck is just too big to get down some things a Wrangler can do. Uh, but I'll tell you that wheelbase and weight distribution of this truck can do things that, that, that a, a Gladiator or Wrangler can't as well. Um, and, <laughs> you know, we'll go through obstacles and and condition dependent, it's, it's all about the tool you choose for the job. Mm-hmm. Hey, look, unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap this segment up, but Jeff Roselli, thanks so much for coming on and giving us some of the background on the TRX. I, for one, cannot wait to get in this thing. And I don't want to just commute back and forth to work, too. I want to go in a serious off-road situation where I can really drive this thing fast off-road. I, I think that's really... Um, my, my dynamics lead, um, you know, one of his guys was really doing the development work on the truck and he came back from the first, you know, we, we had run a thousand miles through the desert to, to kind of sign off on, on everything we'd done. And he came back and he said, you know, this truck is magical. And that was, that was really awesome to hear. Uh, it, 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 every time I get into it, I, I, I find something else and it's like, man, this truck just does it. And, and that's really great. It's, you know, my, my team, the, the whole team who worked on this thing, right, we, we made a just nearly insane, no compromise truck. And, and it's, it's just, it's just great. It's just, I'll, I'll just say it's, it's, it's really awesome. And I, I think that when all of you get a chance to experience it, you're, you're really going to feel the same. Well, you're lucky because not a lot of people get to work on a halo product like this in their careers ever, ever. So you, you get to work on one of the most fun trucks that's ever come out. Yeah, it's uh, it's really been something. It's It's been a heck of a ride, that's for sure. And I do definitely count myself pretty fortunate for this. <laughs> Great. Real good. We're going to uh, sign off with you for now, Jeff. And uh, we're going to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back in just a moment. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. All right, we're back talking all things automotive with Gary Vassalash and Mark Williams. So, so Mark, I've got to ask you, since yeah. since you're the truck enthusiast guy, um, tell us about how you think, I mean, obviously you're in London, so you have not seen this this truck in person, but I mean, so, right. so what's your sense of this? I love Jeff and I love all chief engineers of their products, but uh, if there's anything that defines a pickup truck buyer and even halo truck buying pickup truck buyers, is they're always very skeptical about somebody who promises that their truck or their vehicle can do everything really well. That, that's not what vehicles are about. That's not what pickup trucks are about. Pickup truck buyers understand compromises always have to be made. It's just a matter of discovering where those compromises are being made. And Jeff's being very honest, you can tell that he absolutely loves that product. And when you've dedicated so many years of your life to something like that, it makes perfect sense. But 
figuring out where those compromises are being made is kind of up to us to figure out once we get behind the wheel. So it, it's, it's interesting that he's trying to say that it does a, it's a tow vehicle and it can carry a lot of weight, which all pickup trucks have to do. And that it also does slow rock crawling really well, but it also does really high speed Baja stuff really well. That, that, that's great to say at this point, but that's, that's been the, that's been the holy grail for chief engineers forever since the beginning of the pickup truck. We're going back 120 years. Um, he's not the first chief engineer to say that my truck can do everything really well, and he won't be the last. So we'll have to see. Mark, what what do you think about the the, the market for trucks like the TRX and the Raptor? I mean, is did the Raptor Raptor fill it up, and now the TRX and Raptor are going to have to fight it out, or is the segment segment big enough for the both of them? Well, the the, the Raptor has been the bogey and the target that everybody's been shooting for for over ten years, right? Since it came out in two thousand nine, um, GM. Trent kind of did the rock crawling thing, but did some incredible things with their shock absorbers, those DSSV Multimatic um, shocks that they put in the ZR2. The Spectacular technology that they put in race vehicles as well, too. So it can do a lot of things at high speed very well that other vehicles can't do, but also is an incredible rock crawler. Um, but the Raptor literally has been the vehicle that everybody's been shooting for. And, and now it looks like from the spec sheets and from the way that Jeff is talking, it looks like this is going to be the ultimate head to head. It's, it's the Mustang Camaro. It's the, you know, the, the S the challenger Mustang, the, whatever you want to, you know, compare it to, but this will be the thing that everybody in the world is going to want to try to do first the uh yeah the the trx versus raptor what whatever the raptor becomes when we see its response because you know the raptor engineers are going ballistic as soon as they got all the information <laughs> so what do you, do you think raptor is going to have to go with a v8 uh, I, I i i've been hearing rumors about it i mean and, and the first raptors came out with v8s and everybody was very happy about that and there was a lot of pushback when the EcoBoost, the V6, got into the Raptor. But you know, once we got behind the wheel and see how responsive and and how amazing those computer controls and those traction controls um, could adjust, and how fast that particular 10 speed could respond to all the demands, I, I I think people understood that it could be it could be done with a V6. But to go back with a supercharged V8 that that's you know been in the Mustang for however long it has it would be a phenomenal you know card for them to throw down after the TRX gets to come out and get all the fanfare and, and hoopla. So yeah, I mean that would make sense to me, but it's still going to be a battle for a long time: TRX versus Raptor. And, and you know you mentioned the the ZR2 as as Gary pointed out. That's the Colorado. That's the midsize truck. Exactly. Don't you think Chevrolet is going to have to respond with a full-size Silverado against these two? It's a it's a different company. I mean, it, it took FCA with all of its SRT expertise and all of these Jeep guys and that they can tap into. It took them this long to do this. I don't know how long it's going to take GM to try to respond to do something. A completely different company run in completely different ways. Um, they've got very good and and uh, appropriate and and you know just very fine four-wheel drive systems out there right now but they've got a long history with desert racing as well too that they could tap into but if you're going to try to smash twenty thousand dollars worth of suspension technology into a vehicle and and then charge eighty ninety or a hundred thousand dollars for it then ugh, that's going to be a tough sell to uh, you know, either a legal department or a bean counting department, and you know, depending on how your company is run and how much say those particular two branches of the same corporation have, that might be a very difficult thing for them to do. Mark, getting back to what uh, John was asking in terms of the market, mm -hmm. um, would Ram guys buy Raptors because there was no 
Ram TRX or Chevy guys buy Raptors because they wanted something bigger than the ZR2? I mean, or, yeah. or is it still they stay in their lanes? Yeah, it, it's it's. Uh, I I think I think the stereotype and and for the most part the data has kind of borne this out that. I mean, if, if you're born a Ford guy or if you're born a Chevy guy or if you're born a, a Dodge or a Ram guy, you're, you're always going to lean in that direction. Um, with how competitive things have gotten in the last 10 and 15 years, um, and I think Ram has been the beneficiary of that, uh, I, I think Ford guys have been able to go for the better deal, maybe to Ram, maybe to GM. GM guys have said, okay, you know, maybe if I can get this great deal and this incredible interior and this beautifully smooth ride in the Ram, maybe I'll try and check this out and see what happens. So I think there's a little more cross branding interest than maybe a lot of the stereotypes that are out there about that particular, especially the half ton pickup truck segment that there is. But generally speaking, I, I, I think you know, if, if you've always admired the Ford stuff or admired the GM stuff, that that's kind of where your interest plays. But like we were just mentioning, if, if GM or Chevy or GMC isn't going to offer that high performance pickup truck and high performance defined now is off road. It used to be lightning. You know, it, it used to be, uh, you know, supercharged engines and, and street performance, but that's all changed now. So now it does have to be both a supercharged engine um, or a turbocharged engine seems to be the the price of entry to this segment. So if if GM wants to come to the party, they're going to have to do something uh, something like that. But but I would say, I mean, we saw the success of the Corvette. They have people there who understand how to do a lot of different things at the same time. That it should be doable whether it will be done is a completely separate issue so do people who buy these off-road vehicles let's specifically let's let's just stay with with the pickup i mean are they literally taking them off-road or are they like the jeep owner that once in a blue moon goes on a gravel road yeah that that's a very good question um it, I think everybody, I mean, people buy pickup trucks for many, many different reasons. That's that's why it's very difficult sometimes for us on our end to listen to these marketing spiels about we've done incredible surveys and we've got them into rooms and we've talked to them about what they want to do and what they don't want to do and what they care about and what they don't care about it's hard for me not to just go deaf and dumb when I'm listening to somebody trying to tell me about what their truck buyer wants. And this is the product for them because in a lot of ways that truck buyer um, defies all of those particular desires and needs from these people to put them in a cubby hole. Um, People buy pickup trucks for a lot of different reasons and they use them for a lot of different reasons. And that might be use once a year, that might be use once a month, maybe it's maybe it's it's only on the weekend, but that vehicle has to be able to accommodate what they want to do, whether it's once a year or once a week. So having a good solid off-road package is incredibly important. Um, the, the, the only reservation that I have when I hear about these types of halo vehicles that do these incredible things at high speeds in the desert is that you can just hear, you know, the number of people that are interested in that kind of performance from a vehicle. That's a lot of people in Arizona, absolutely. And they're going to sell as many of these TRXs as they do Raptors. Raptors are all over the place in Phoenix, just like they're all over the place in every other kind of Southwest in Texas and kind of those Southern desert racing, you know, dry wash blasting places. But, but I don't know how many of those guys that like to go high speed in the desert are also interested in a 
hugely flexible, articulating Jeep type of rock crawling Rubicon trail type of performance as well. I mean, again, you're just getting into a smaller and smaller number of people. Trucks have to do very specific things. Um, that, that bed is there for a reason. The, the way a pickup truck looks and the fact that it hasn't changed for 120 years, box in the front for the engine, box in the middle for the cab, for the, for the passengers, and box in the back for the cargo. That, that's the same thing we have now that we saw 120 years ago, which is why the Cybertruck was such a very weird thing for people to try to get their heads around. People know what a pickup truck is. They know why they're buying that pickup truck. And if your pickup truck can go really fast that you do once or twice or three times a year when you go out with your buddies, but it can't really carry a lot of weight in the bed because you've got these really tall coil springs that get compressed that have these suspension shocks that try to stiffen up and create less wobble because you've got coil springs trying to balance a heavy load on top. That, that's, that's a problem that if there's a compromise that's gonna be made when they bought that vehicle to carry a load occasionally, whether it's from Home Depot or from their office or you know maybe moving a kid to college or something, if, if it's not gonna be able to do that very well, that's, that's a compromise that sometimes um, people hold in their head for a long time, talk to a lot of their friends about and get on chat rooms and tell everybody else about. And that's not necessarily the kinds of things that the manufacturers want, want being done when they've created this vehicle to do something very specific. So you, you always have to be careful. I love the 8,100 pound towing capacity. That's very normal for a half ton pickup truck. Even a lot of mid-sized pickup trucks, 8,100 pounds is about right. That's a high number, obviously, for anything that's sold in that category. But we all know that guys who buy trucks don't stay within the boundaries that the manufacturers <laughs> provide them. They, they do a lot of things they're not supposed to. And the engineers should be considering that when they're designing these vehicles as well. So, so let me ask you, is, is there a market for small trucks, small pickup trucks? And, 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 and what do you make of, um, John, correct me if I'm wrong, is, is it, what is the name of the Santa Cruz or something that, that Hyundai is going to bring out a version right. like the Ridgeline? Is, is that right. what it is? Yeah. Yeah. We, we've seen, we've seen them in the past, right? We've, we've all been around long enough to remember the Subaru Brat and the Subaru Baja and uh, all sorts of different concepts that we've seen put out by different manufacturers that essentially take what uh, a lot of us auto journalists are saying, well, how come you don't make a pickup truck on a car platform that drives nice and can corner well and you know feel really comfortable when we're driving most of the situations that these vehicles are being driven in around town, through cities, to work and back to home? Um, and maybe that's where that small pickup truck segment is going to bear itself out in. And, and Hyundai is, is one of those manufacturers that have played with that idea with their concepts and vehicles that are coming down. If the Telluride, which has won just about every single award out there, um, is a nice platform. You can extend that a little bit, flex and, you know, put a kind of a modified pickup truck a uh, small pickup bed on it with a very comfortable interior and a nice performing engine in it with a good all wheel drive system and a good, you know, kind of adventure and all weather, maybe even a little, you know, light adventure uh, terrain system on it that could take you places that, that you might want to go. I, I think as a family oriented vehicle, there's probably a place for that out there for people who don't want a minivan or don't want a, a full size SUV, want something a little more, I don't know, with a little more personality or a little more cargo carrying capacity, that there might be a place for that. But whether or not there's a small pickup truck, um, like the old Datsun pickup trucks that we used to see, like the old Toyota pickup trucks that were small and brought over from Japan 20 and 30 years ago, 
I, I don't know. There's just, there isn't the same feeling, I think, with that young, new licensed crowd that they want to get that cheap two-door pickup truck that they can pile all their friends in the bed in and 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 only spend maybe you know fifteen hundred dollars on buying that. I I don't know if the millennials or the the you know the iPhone crowd. I don't know if they're interested in those kind of inexpensive small uh, vehicles anymore. And 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 if they if that buying group isn't there, I don't know if there's going to be a segment for uh, for small little pickup trucks below that mid sized level. Hmm. And and if there is, I, I'm not, you know, I never say never, but but I just don't know how how that segment can be more than twenty or fifty thousand units a year. Hmm. Yeah. Hey, look, we we've got to take an, another uh, quick commercial break here. Hold on, just a sec. We'll be back in a minute talking more. The world is changing at an ever increasing pace. No matter what the mode of transportation, there is always the need for an efficient propulsion system. And that's exactly what Borg Warner has been doing since the earliest days of the automotive industry. We create innovative mobility technologies that reduce energy consumption and emissions while improving performance. Our proven track record has made us an industry leader in forward-looking propulsion solutions for combustion, hybrid, and electric vehicles. All right, we're back. Mark, I got a couple of truck questions yet for you. Do you know anything about this new small pickup that Ford's going to be coming out with, I think, next year? Some people are saying maybe it's going to be called the Maverick front-wheel drive unit body. Do you know any more about that? Uh, I, I know what I'm hearing in the grapevine. Obviously, the, the chat forums are going ballistic. There's been quite a few spy photos, um, even... Um, even some early production engineering shots that I've seen uh, that have been snuck out. Uh, it, it it makes sense for somebody like Ford, who seems very very well dialed into their pickup truck buyers. Um, that on the work side, and and maybe Gary, this goes back to answering your question a little better. There's definitely a call on the commercial side of that industry for some small little capable and powerful uh, platforms that can carry a lot of load, maybe running around construction sites, running to and from construction sites. Things like we see in Europe with the uh, side flopping beds that are you know, basically just regular cabs they're driving around that you can load 2000 pounds into and they can comfortably and safely drive to the next construction site. Maybe there's a, a place for that slotted. And I think that's where Ford's going with this. The, the Transit Connect is an amazingly strong little van platform that they have. And they have have different versions around the world um, that are more commercially oriented where they basically remove the cargo van portion slapped on a very um, functional type of platform on the back and uh, with just a few suspension modifications with that um, kind of unibody frame, it's very, very strong and very, very capable of carrying heavy loads. So as a work vehicle, a, a little Maverick, which is a, a name that resonates for a lot of people like me, older guys who can remember back when the Maverick was a thing for Ford, um, might might be something that could fill a slot uh, for a lot of people. Yeah. And then uh, Nikola, they're going to be coming out with this uh, pickup truck called the Badger. It's going to be electric. And I, I think there might even be a, a hydrogen fuel cell. In fact, I know. No, yeah. we, we had Trevor yeah. Milton, the, the founder of Nikola, on the show here a number of weeks ago. Um, and he said uh, he was going to sign with a major OEM to build it. There was some EV blogger that was interviewing him this week and came out and he said, yeah, we've we've already settled on who it is. He didn't say if uh, they had signed a, a contract or a memorandum of understanding, but I'm just wondering, have you heard anything? Wow. No, I uh, that's actually news to me. That's a much further along than I remember. In fact, that's what one thing I want to pick Gary's brain about, too, that this whole electric pickup segment is obviously getting a lot of attention in the media, and it? And it's it seems very fashionable kind of thing, but um, I, I guess I, again I'm going to be a little more skeptical. Have a few more reservations. There's 
obviously people with a lot of money who are going to pay for uh, a vehicle like that. And it's going to it's going to carry a lot of status for that kind of um, impressions buyer who wants to get a lot of attention. But again, I just go back, uh, you know, pickup trucks are pretty well defined. And and if if you can have an electric pickup truck that looks like a pickup truck, I guess there's value in that. But if if a pickup truck is going to have its range cut in half because it tows a small camper trailer behind it, and if you have to worry about how quickly that that dial goes down to zero because you have that heavy load, either in the cargo bed or being towed behind it, that that's going to raise a lot of yellow and red flags for a lot of people that are going to ask a lot of questions that a truck engineer should not be allowing a vehicle like that to, to show that many compromises with. But, but we'll see. I mean, I, I've been wrong in the auto industry with predictions before. So that, that may be something that'll change. But doesn't it sort of seem that we're going to see sort of a bifurcated market the same way that, you know, pickup trucks exist today, that there's the commercial fleet buyer and then there's the consumer. And, and so, you know, we're seeing, say, Rivian is saying, okay, we're, we're going to make a lifestyle vehicle, a camping adventure vehicle. And, and, and um, then on the other hand, you have a Lordstown Motors, which is basically saying, no, we're going to be building commercial trucks. And I sort of get the sense from, from Nikola that that's, that's their, their play is primarily to sell to the commercial buyer. Someone who might be buying one of their class eights would say, okay, you know, let's, let's buy a fleet of these smaller units for, you know, the people who are, are, you know, driving around the, the marshalling yards or what have you. Yeah. I, I, th I think you've hit the nail on the head, just referring to the fact that, that uh, they've kind of started their, their uh, entire business model with that class eight segment, you know, big haul trucking. That's something that resonates at least with core pickup truck buyers, at least, at least the image of the hard work, hard towing, hard hauling kind of segment. And if if they can kind of overlap and even kind of, you know, borrow some of that credibility from those type of vehicles that they're making, whether they're hydrogen or they're full electric, um, or some combination of both, then then that that seems like a way that they could make inroads and and at the very least. Um, kind of put to rest some of the questions or concerns that a lot of tr traditional pickup truck buyers might have. But I, I also think you're exactly right. The commercial segment from the personal use segment, um, Ford has done an incredible job of, of being able to not just um, talk to those two markets differently, uh, but also create products that those particular segments absolutely love and feel like they're being treated like kings with. So, so, and, and that's something that GM is obviously very good at with. And I think FCA is getting better as well too. So I, I, I think, I think it's possible. And, and uh, if, if you want to just keep fragmenting a particular segment, especially something as big as a truck buying segment, I, I think there's money to be made there. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if that became a big success. Well, John, you've mentioned many times that you don't see anybody making money on EVs unless you have a high price point. And I mean, and isn't isn't the you know commercial as well as the consumer side of the EV um, markets ideal for being able to get high prices? I mean, I mean, what does a King Ranch edition of an F one fifty cost? Seventy five thousand, maybe more. Yeah, probably more. And uh... I, I think, you know, the, the sell for electric trucks to fleets is probably an easier sell in the sense that if you can prove to a fleet that their total cost of ownership over the life of this vehicle is going to be cheaper, they will pay more money up front and know that they're going to get it back in less maintenance, lower energy costs compared to fuel. You know, the brakes last longer. There's no tune-ups, et cetera, et cetera. So as long as the fleets pencil the numbers and say, yeah, my cost per mile, in fact, more than that, my total cost of ownership is going to be cheaper with an electric, they'll go for it. 
Are you seeing that as well, Mark? Yeah, I think I think that's that's usually the way those flea buyers go. Is that that's all they're looking at? They're looking at the numbers. They want to know how much it's going to cost to maintain over the year and then over the life of the vehicle. And if if you have a commercial vehicle that you know is only going to drive a prescribed route, you know it's only ever going to carry you know a particular and specific load, and you know that it's always going to be able to get back to a charging station or get to a construction site that has you know, some kind of capability to charge it back up too, then that's a much easier sell to somebody than somebody who wants to know how far they can go on a vacation because they're limited by where the charging stations are or or how far the, their range is. So yeah, there's a completely different set of circumstances for the two different buyers. So yeah, smart Mark, Go ahead, John. And I was just going to add real quickly, you know, when you get into uh, battery electrics or even hybrid trucks, I'm I'm intrigued by this uh, power outlet that Ford is putting into the new F-150 on, on the hybrid. And even, I, I guess it's the non-hybrid version. So don't you think there's some appeal too to commercial buyers that, you know, I, I don't need to haul a, a, an electric generator to the site. I just plug this stuff into my pickup. Absolutely. And, and uh, personal use buyers as well, too. I think I mean, you're bringing a, a mobile plant with you wherever you go. For campers, that's a no-brainer. They'll pay for that. Okay. The, the thing that struck me as being odd about that, though, John, is, is that, okay, I get it for the hybrid part, but, I mean, why are you running a giant engine to, to get, you know, to, to plug in what? TV set? I mean, it's, it's, just like, it's, just like, it's like crazy. <laughs> well, well, it is and it isn't. I mean, if if you've got your bed full of tools and equipment and oh, you've got a pickup where I don't have to haul a generator around, you know, again, from a commercial standpoint, there might be an appeal of saying, yeah, I don't care if I run the engine. I don't have to bring the generator. And I don't have to bring gas cans to keep feeding the generator. Hmm. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll yes, see. I'm, we I'm just see. saying. I I see where this could make sense. Didn't didn't GM offer that on? Remember when they had their hybrid that they worked with? What was it? Mercedes and BMW. It was a um, I forget what they called it, but but they also had a plug in that. Yeah, and, it, it just a lot of the manufacturers include inverters, so you can you can plug in a three prong plug. I think even the Honda Ridgeline has a two prong plug. I think in their in their bed as well too. That, that's it's it's a it's a convenience. I think people are kind of tied into, but I, I think John's right that the commercial angle. I mean, the number of pickup beds that you see with a generator in the bed, especially around construction sites or places you know, wherever there's a lot of construction going on, it's, it's phenomenal. And if you don't have to bring all that equipment, you can just run an engine or, you know, solve problems that way. That, that, that seems to kind of make sense for that buyer who's thinking long-term. Mm -hmm. Dual mode hybrid, Gary. There you go. Wasn't there that the name go. of it? Yes. yes. I don't know where I pulled that out of. <laughs> well done. Yeah. So Mark, I want to ask you two questions. One, truck one non okay so there you are in england so a what are you i mean so so obviously there are not a lot of f-150s or rams rolling around in the streets of london what are they using instead that's question number one and then question number two is you know we hear a lot about congestion charges and and um do you see a discernible difference in the types of vehicles that people are driving there versus your normal home in California? Okay, question one first. Um, definitely no pickup truck, no half ton pickup trucks here. There's there's plenty of what we would call mid size pickup trucks. That's what they think is a full size pickup truck here. I, I, the Ranger must sell reasonably oh, yeah. well there. And in fact, that that would be my uh, the number one vehicle that I see around all the time. In fact, I've even seen a couple of Ranger Raptors, which are just being sold here as well too, which are beautiful little trucks. I will say, I tried. Tried to get my hands on one over here, but could not work it out with the Ford representative. But does, does maybe, Ford make 
Does Ford make right hand steer versions of the, the yeah. Ranger? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The Ranger is obviously very popular all over the world. It's hugely, um, yeah, hu a hugely popular global platform, which is yeah, different I, I from the one that they have. I, I, I figured they sold them there, but I didn't know if Ford, sh you know, shopped that out, the conversion, or if they did it themselves. No, I, I'm not exactly sure if they're doing it like we do in the U.S. where, or at least what they've talked about doing in the U.S. where the dealers are doing it. I'm not sure if they're putting them together at the factories here or if they're, if it's an after factory kind of upfit. Um, yeah, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if they're doing it in the plant because very intelligently, I think, in the current generation Mustang, Ford started building right-hand steer versions in the Flat Rock Michigan assembly plant. Wow. Yeah, I, I'll, I, I will want to track that down. That's a very interesting question. But r Rangers are all over the place. Mitsubishi L200s, which is an incredibly popular vehicle all over the place. Um, a couple of Mercedes X classes around here. I see buzzing around. Uh, Volkswagen Amarox, they're around as well too. Um, but that's that's basically it. I mean, it's uh, if you want to be a starved and hungry human being, be a truck guy in London. <laughs> it definitely you, you have yourself yearning and looking around the corner and listening for things too. And they're all diesels, which is wonderful. I love diesels as well too. Um, so second question, uh, as far as um, what kind of vehicles are here, A-class and B-class vehicles, so definitely much smaller vehicles here with all the small um, streets and lanes that they have are more popular. They're, they're confusing to me. I, I tend to look at them as payload that I need to put into the back of a pickup truck bed. For the most part, I always have to worry about the ramps <laughs> that I need to try to create to get them up and in the bed. <laughs> um, but uh, other than that, there's, there's, I, I'm constantly, uh, surprised about how many BMWs and Mercedes and Audis are all over the place here, depending on which town you're in, there's either more Mercedes than BMWs, more Range Rovers than Jaguars, more Jaguars than just about anything else. So I, that, that's about the only thing that I've recognized and kind of seen around here. But my my eye isn't very discerning when it comes to all those cars. If it doesn't have a pickup bed on the back, <laughs> it's not catching my eye. So <laughs> I have to admit that. That's great. Hey, uh, we should probably wrap up. Uh, we're at the, a little past the top of the hour here. Wow. But, uh, yeah, that went by fast. Mark, what a pleasure. It, it, it's been really good having you on the show here. No, thank you guys very much. Thanks, I, Mark. Yeah. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Appreciate We're it. Good. Stay well. Right, Gary, we'll just keep on trucking. Oh. <laughs> Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. Visit our website, autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with AutoLine Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with AutoLine This Week. There's all that and much more at AutoLine.tv.